Peter Curtin, a.k.a. the Vampire of Dusseldorf, and the Dusseldorf Monster. He was a German serial killer who committed a series of murders and sexual assaults between February and November of 1929 in the city of Dusseldorf. In the years before these assaults and murders, Curtin had amassed a lengthy criminal record for offenses including arson and attempted murder. He became known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf because he made attempts to drink the blood from his victim's wounds. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host, and thank you for joining the podcast today. Of all of the 1 million true crime podcasts that you could be listening to right now, you chose mine, and trust me, that's not lost on me. I know that you could be doing a million other things, not only listening to podcasts, but you know, going on about your day and doing whatever it is that you do. Uh, you could be doing that, but you're listening to me right now, and you could be doing that while you're listening to me. Um, I listen to podcasts while I clean the kitchen, mop the floors, that kind of thing. So you could be doing that right now. But I want you to know that I do appreciate the, the, the fact that you take time out of your day to download and listen to this podcast. I love you for it, and it means a lot to me. And in doing the research for this podcast, I often find stories like the one we're going to talk about today of people that grow up to be just absolute monsters, serial killers, just vicious, despicable people. They often grew up in a really crappy situation at home. And because of that, I'm hyper fixated on the kind of parent that I am. I try to be the best parent that I can be and make the best decisions that I can make. And recently I had a conversation with my kiddo. Um, he's in high school, by the way. And it made me remember to back when I was his age and younger. I was raised to respect adults. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. I don't talk back and that kind of thing. You just assume as a kid, adults know what's going on. They have all the answers. Grown-ups are problem solvers. And then you become an adult and you realize that a lot of us are idiots. My son asked how I learned how to be a parent, and I told him the truth. I had good parents, so I kind of just copy what they did when I was growing up. Plus, I make it up as I go. As a lot of us are, I'm just kind of winging it here as a dad in 2023. We're in uncharted waters. We have no idea what's going on with this world, and we're just kind of doing the best that we can do. And I think that you are a good parent if you can genuinely say that you are doing the best that you can do. But as you will hear in the story we're going to talk about today, that is definitely not the case. Before we get going with your story today, this is your official reminder to subscribe wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts and connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode, as well as at 10minutemurder.com. Now to today's story. Peter Curtin was born into a poverty-stricken, abusive family in Molheim, Germany, on the 26th of May, 1883, the oldest of 13 children. Curtin's parents were both alcoholics who lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and with Curtin's father frequently beating up his wife and children, particularly when he was drunk. And being an alcoholic, that was pretty often. When intoxicated, Curtin's father often forced his wife and children to stand in front of him, like some sort of psychotic military formation, reporting for duty. He would then order his wife to strip naked and engage in intercourse with her as the children watched. He was jailed for 18 months at one time for raping his eldest daughter, who was 13 years old. Shortly after, Curtin's mother obtained a separation order, divorced the hunk of trash, and then later remarried, relocating herself to Dusseldorf. In 1888, Peter Curtin attempted to drown one of his playmates, an early sign that he wasn't quite right upstairs. Four years later, he befriended a local dog catcher who lived in the same building as his family and began tagging along with him when he'd make his rounds. The individual often tortured and killed the animals he caught, and Curtin soon became an active and willing participant in torturing the animals. Being the eldest surviving son, Curtin was the target of much of his father's physical abuse and frequently refused to return home from school because of that. Although he was a good student, he later recollected his academic performance suffered due to the extensive violence that he endured at home. From an early age, Curtin often ran away from home for periods of time ranging from days to weeks. Much of the time, 
Curtin spent on the streets, and he was in the company of criminals and social misfits. Via these street acquaintances, Curtin was introduced to various forms of petty crime, which he initially committed as a means to feeding himself and getting clothing for himself while he was living on the streets. Curtin later claimed to have committed his first murders at the age of nine, when he pushed a school friend that he knew was unable to swim off of a log raft. When a second boy attempted to save that drowning kid, Curtin held his head under the water so that both boys drowned. Both deaths were ruled by authorities as being accidental. At the age of 13, Curtin formed a relationship with a girl his age, and although she allowed him to undress her and fondle her, she would resist any attempts that he made to have sex. To apparently relieve his sexual urges, Curtin resorted to acts of bestiality with the sheep and pigs and goats in the local stables, but later claimed that it felt best to him if he stabbed these animals in the process. He says he stopped doing this when someone caught him raping and stabbing a pig. He also attempted to rape the same sister that his father had earlier served jail time for molesting. In 1897, Curtin left school. At his father's insistence, he got a job as an apprentice molder. This apprenticeship lasted for about two years before Curtin stole money from the house, plus approximately 300 marks, which is German dollars, from his employer, and he ran away from home. He relocated to Kobel Lenz, where he began a brief relationship with a prostitute a couple of years older than him that he claimed willingly submitted to every form of sexual perversion he demanded of her. He was apprehended just four weeks later and charged with both breaking and entering and theft and sentenced to one month in jail. He was released from prison in August of 1899 and reverted to the life of petty crime that he had lived before that arrest. Curtin claimed to have committed his first murder, after drowning those kids before, in November of 1899. In his 1930 confessions to investigators, Curtin claimed to have picked up an 18-year-old girl and persuaded her to accompany him to the park. There, he said he had sex with her before strangling her into unconsciousness with his bare hands. He left her there for dead. No records exist that corroborate Curtin's claim. If this attack did take place, the victim likely survived the assault. Nonetheless, Curtin later stated that, via his committing this act, he had proven to himself that this was the peak of sexual gratification. Pause. I've stated before that 10-minute murder rule number three is that we don't kink shame. If you're into things that others may find strange, that's totally fine. However, those things have to be legal and consensual. What this guy was doing obviously does not fall under that umbrella. Shortly thereafter, in 1900, Curtin was arrested for fraud. He was released and then rearrested later in that same year for the same charge. Although on the second occasion, charges pertaining to his earlier Dusseldorf thefts plus the attempted murder of a girl with a firearm were added to the indictment. Curtin was sentenced to four years imprisonment in October of 1900. Considering all the charges, super lenient. He served this sentence in Derendorf, a borough of Dusseldorf. Released in the summer of 1904, Curtin was drafted into the Imperial German Army. He was deployed to the city of Metz to serve in the 98th Infantry Regiment. But that did not last very long. Rules and being told what to do weren't really his vibe, so he bounced. He deserted the army. That autumn, Curtin began committing acts of arson, which, if you know anything about serial arsonists, they like to discreetly watch from a distance as emergency services attempt to put the fires out. The majority of these fires were in barns and haylofts, and Curtin later admitted to the police that he had committed around 24 acts of arson upon his arrest that New Year's Eve. He also freely admitted that these fires had been committed both for his sexual excitement and in hopes of burning sleeping homeless people alive that may be sleeping in those barns and haylofts. As a result of his desertion, Curtin was tried by the military court and convicted, in addition to multiple counts of arson, robbery, and attempted robbery, and was subsequently imprisoned from 1905 to 1913. Curtin served a sentence, with much of his time spent in solitary confinement, for repeated instances of insubordination. Like I said before, not a big fan of rules and being told what to do. He would later claim to investigators and psychologists this period of incarceration fueled the erotic fantasies that he had and expanded to include graphic fantasies of striking out against society and killing masses of people. And Curtin later claimed that he derived the sort of pleasures from these visions that other people would get from thinking about a naked woman 
adding that he occasionally spontaneously ejaculated while preoccupied with such thoughts. The first murder that Curtin committed without a doubt occurred on the 25th of May, 1913. During the course of a burglary at a tavern in Mulheim, he encountered a nine-year-old girl named Christine Klein asleep in her bed. Curtin strangled the child, then slashed her twice across the throat with a pocket knife. He became sexually excited as he heard the blood dripping from her wounds onto the floor, beside her bed, and onto his hand. The following day, Curtin returned to the area to drink in a tavern located directly opposite that in which he had murdered the girl before, so that he could listen to the locals' reactions to the child's murder. He later recollected to the investigators that he derived an extreme sense of gratification from the general disgust and repulsion that he overheard from the various tavern-goers' conversations. Two months later, again in the course of committing a burglary, with the aid of a skeleton key, Curtin broke into a home in Dusseldorf, discovering a 17-year-old girl named Gertrude Franken asleep in her bed. Curtin manually strangled her, again becoming sexually excited at the sight of the blood spurting out of her mouth. He managed to escape from the scene of this attempted murder. Just days after that attempt, July 14th, Curtin was arrested for a series of arson attacks and burglaries. He was sentenced to six years in prison, and repeated instances of insubordination while in prison saw his incarceration extended by a further two years. Curtin served this sentence in a military prison in the town of Brieg. Released in April of 1921, Curtin relocated to Altenburg, where he initially lived with his sister. Through his sister, Curtin became acquainted with a woman three years older than him named Augustine, a sweet shop proprietor and former prostitute who had previously been convicted of shooting her fiancé to death. Two years later, Curtin and Augustine were married, and although the couple regularly engaged in sex, Peter Curtin later admitted that he could only do this by fantasizing about committing violence against other individuals, and after their wedding night, he only engaged in intercourse with his wife at her insistence. For the first time in his life, Curtin obtained regular employment, also becoming an active trades union official, although with the exception of his wife, he formed no close friendships. In 1925, he returned with Augustine to Dusseldorf, where he soon began affairs with a servant girl named Titi and a housemaid named Metch. Both women were frequently subjected to partial strangulation when they submitted to intercourse. After he would strangle them into near unconsciousness, he would tell them, that's what love means. When his wife discovered his infidelity, Titi reported Curtin to the police, claiming that he had seduced her. Metch alleged that Curtin had raped her, the more serious charge was later dropped, although Titi's allegations were pursued, thus earning Curtin an eight-month prison sentence for seduction and threatening behavior. Curtin served six months of this sentence, with his early release being upon the condition that he left Dusseldorf. He later successfully appealed the ruling that he had to leave the city. Two days after the murder of Gertrude Alberman, a local communist newspaper received a map revealing the location of the grave of Maria Hahn, in this drawing, Curtin also revealed precisely where he had left Alberman's body, which had been found earlier that day, describing the exact position of her corpse, which he later stated could be found face down among bricks and rubble. An analysis of the handwriting revealed that the author was the same individual who had anonymously informed the police in a letter dated the 14th of October that he had killed Han and buried her body at the edge of the woods. Each of the three letters Curtin sent to the newspapers and police describing his exploits and threatening further assaults and murders were examined by graphologists, who confirmed the same individual had written each letter, which led the chief inspector of the Berlin police to conclude that one man was responsible for most, if not all, of the rash of assaults and murders that were currently going on. The murder of Gertrude Alberman proved to be Curtin's final fatal attack, Although he did engage in a series of non-fatal hammer attacks and attempted strangulations between February and May of 1930, maiming 10 victims in these assaults, all the victims survived and many were able to describe their attacker to the police. On the 14th of May, 1930, an unknown man approached a 20-year-old woman named Maria Budlick at a Dusseldorf station. Discovering Maria had traveled to Dusseldorf in search of a job and a place to stay, he offered to walk her towards a local hostel. Maria agreed to follow the man, although she became apprehensive when he attempted to lead her through a scarcely populated park. The pair began to argue when she voiced her hesitation. 
another man appeared and approached the two, asking whether Maria was being pestered by that stranger. When she nodded, the man that she had been arguing with just simply walked away. The identity of the man who came to Maria's aid, the good Samaritan hero, was Peter Curtin. Peter then invited her to his apartment to have a drink and some food to eat before Maria correctly deduced the underlying motive for Curtin's hospitality. She stated that she was uninterested in engaging in sex with him. Curtin calmly agreed and offered to lead her to a hotel. He instead lured her to the Grafenberg Woods, where he seized her by the throat and attempted to strangle her as he raped her. When Maria began to scream, Curtin released his grip on her throat and let her go. Maria did not report this assault to the police. Instead, she described her ordeal in a letter to a friend, but she addressed the letter incorrectly. That letter was opened at the post office by a clerk, and that clerk forwarded the letter to the Dusseldorf police, and it was read by the chief inspector, who assumed that there was a chance that Maria's assailant might be the Dusseldorf murderer. He interviewed Maria, telling him one of the reasons that Peter Curtin had spared her was because she lied to him and told him that she couldn't remember where he lived. She led the police directly to Curtin's home. When the landlady of the property let Maria into the room, she confirmed that this was the right place. On the evening of July 1st, 1931, Peter Curtin received his last meal. He ordered wiener schnitzel, a bottle of white wine, and fried potatoes. He ate the entire meal before requesting a second helping. The prison staff decided to grant this request. At 6 o'clock the next morning, July 2nd, Curtin was beheaded by guillotine in the grounds of the Klingelhuns prison. Shortly before his head was placed on the guillotine, Curtin turned to the psychiatrist and asked the question, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. When asked if he had any last words to say, Peter Curtin simply smiled and replied, No. No. 